Hi, welcome back to the Rich Fritzky Show. I know I keep promising baseball, Phil Rizzuto, and all kinds of fun old tales. It is coming soon, I promise, but today, for some reason, I just wanted to put my Irish on in honor of the coming of St. Patrick's Day. I have always worn my Cassidy Sweeney Irish when I was just a little boy at a St. Patrick's Day parade. I am told, of course, I have no memory of this, that I, in great happiness, looked up at my mom and said, Mom, I am so happy. I am so glad that I am Irish. And my, you know, sweet spoil sport of uh, a grandmother, Nana, chimed in and said, Rich, you know you're not all Irish. And I said, I know, but I'll be all Irish when I grow up. I'm a Jersey City born Irish and Austrian Catholic. And I was taught never to walk by a church without stopping in to say hello. As my grandfather said, you wouldn't pass by a friend, now would you? But not even church services necessarily needed to be honored when the Irish of Notre Dame were playing football. Oh, what a confusing bunch we were. When a good family friend passed, my cousin Joe Cassidy had to sneak onto the field post-game in the snows of December to toss his ashes on the touchdown Jesus side of the Notre Dame field. It was his last wish. As to my own brand of Irish nationalism, I honor the life of Michael Collins, the sacrifice of Michael Collins. As to that, you ought to see the Liam Neeson, Michael Collins movie. And now into the heart of my two favorite Irish authors. There haven't been all that many literary masterpieces written about growing up in Ireland. But there are two most special works, James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, in which we journey with Stephen Dedalus, who searches for beauty and truth, and in Ireland, where devout Catholicism and nationalistic fervor are the paramount forces. And more recently, there was Frank McCourt's brilliant, Pulitzer Prize-winning, hard-hitting Angela's Ashes, where we journey with the writer's own brutally impoverished family who grow up on the bitter and cold streets of an unforgiving limerick. Both works are richly autobiographical. Frank McCourt's is a memoir in which the reader literally bleeds with the author on every page. Joyce's work, while not as overt or transparent as McCourt's in its presentation, also is autobiographical, as the ever-searching protagonist Daedalus is clearly Joyce himself. Both writers were children of an Ireland that was only to be discovered somewhere between the rigors of faith and the lingering pride of an aberrant nationalism. In each, we discover that their journeys to manhood were influenced and shaped by sociological forces beyond their control. Each manages to transition to adulthood, but only by freeing themselves of both church and patriotism. Two faced, two ideologies, two blunt and often abrasive forces. Both Frank McCourt and Stephen Dedalus remake themselves, but only by freeing themselves from that which defines the Irish heart and the Irish soul. And yet the authors who find release remain forever bound and tied to that from which they escape. They are expatriates to be sure, but they remain Irish to the bone. In story, they long to recast or remake their land. They long for something more, look to something more, and express newfound faith in that something more. At the beginning of Angela's Ashes, Frank McCourt relays his earliest memories. He portrays himself as innocently ignorant, but inventive and creative, just as any child who lives in such abject poverty on the mean streets must. He writes, there's a picture on the wall by the range of a man with long brown hair and sad eyes. He is pointing to his chest where there is a big heart with flames coming out of it. Mam tells us that's the sacred heart of Jesus. And I want to know why the man's heart is on fire and why doesn't he throw water on it? As a child, Frank McCord had no idea who Jesus really was or what the sacred heart signified. He was later introduced to the practices of an organized religion that appeared to him cruel and unforgiving and certainly not loving. 
And yet the loving, forgiving Christ was later destined to be a force in his life. In like fashion, James Joyce portrayed his alter ego, Stephen Dedalus, in a manner that wasn't quite as ignorant at the onset of his novel, but every bit as troubled and inquisitive as young Frank McCourt. Daedalus simply never stops wondering about the mysteries and seeming clashes between science and church, reason and faith, and he goes on to explore the thoughts of all of the world's greatest philosophers and are the dimensions and the mysteries that trouble. Joyce writes, What was after the universe? Nothing. But was there anything around the universe to show where it stopped before the nothing place began? It could not be a wall but there could be a thin, thin line there all around everything. It was very big to think about, everything and everywhere, but only God could do that. Each young Frank McCourt and the erudite Stephen Dedalus were seekers of understanding and truth. McCourt reached beyond the cruel shackles of the bitterest poverty imaginable to grow and to fashion a life unencumbered by parental alcoholism and cruel indifference, and both reached beyond the ignorant trappings of a church and of a heralded nationalism, which was taking far more than it was giving. The questions they asked in the early stages of life only foreshadowed the forces that would profoundly influence later in life. Forces and answers, if you will, whose question never sees Joyce, again writes, The master says it's a glorious thing to die for the faith, and dad says it's a glorious thing to die for Ireland. And I wonder if there's anyone in the world who would like us to live. Joyce's Stephen Dedalus may have been affected even more so than McCourt by these two forces. Dedalus' young life in Ireland was torn between both the Catholic religion's demands regarding piety and sanctity and the demands that also were placed on the youth of Ireland to embrace a nationalism that had been ever-evolving as a result of what was an already 700-year-old battle for Irish independence. All the reader has to do is recall the disturbing Christmas dinner argument in Stephen's home. His dad and two great family friends erupted into a passionate discussion over the Catholic Church's place in politics and the morality of the Church's denunciations of the same. Nobody is saying a word against them, said Mr. Dedalus, so long as they don't meddle in politics. The bishops and priests of Ireland have spoken, said Dante and they must be obeyed. Let them leave politics alone, said Mr. Casey, or the people may leave their church alone. This argument raged on throughout the entire dinner until Dante, a great friend, finally storms out, leaving Mr. Dedalus to comfort a sobbing Mr. Casey. As to this argument, what was most important is that while the issues and the passions were certainly real, And while it took place in Stephen's own home, and while Stephen listened and even sympathized, he did not buy into either side. Stephen determined not to go where they did. It might be said that he just refused to drink the Kool-Aid. Frank McCourt and Stephen Dedalus battled the predominant forces that most young Irishmen succumbed to. Of course, McCourt's battle was exacerbated by the need to overcome the cruelest poverty and emotional trauma. Young Frank McCourt would lose three of his siblings. Three of his siblings would die in their youth of starvation and malnutrition. But ultimately, they make similar choices as to how to deal with these forces. Both decided that it was best to simply escape as Joyce himself will move to the European continent, and McCourt will do so by garnering the resources with which to go to America. In Angela's Ashes, McCourt's escape is literal. As the memoir culminates there, he goes to America, a journey that began long ago with his teacher, Mr. O'Halloran. One day in class, after ranting about the atrocities of the Irish class system, O'Halloran tells McCourt and his fellow students, 
You must get out of this country, boys. Go to America, McCourt. Do you hear me? Go to America. McCourt replied, I do, sir. And from that moment on, his thoughts were hell-bent on America, the land of opportunity. Almost everything he did for the remainder of his days in Ireland was practically bent on helping his family and then better enabling that escape to America. Finally, his family at peace, he saved up enough money and he went. Joyce's Stephen Dedalus escapes in a different way. Philosophically, theologically, spiritually, he reaches beyond and sets his sights on a life that is free from the encumbrances and pervading negativity of what had become to him the very Irish experience. Daedalus determined that he had to rise above the indifference and the problems tearing his Ireland apart by becoming a true artist. In the concluding passages of A Portrait of the Artist, he cries out, I go to encounter for the million time in the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. This was Stephen's goal. By escaping the forces that were tearing his Ireland apart, he hoped to better shed light upon the undiscovered and true identity of his race, his people, his Ireland. The protagonists in both of these powerful and critically acclaimed stories gave voice to what was in the heart and soul of the authors themselves. Angela's Ashes, a memoir that detailed the impoverished horror of Frank McCourt's youth and the indifference of the then church and the indifference of the cry of patriotism. While Stephen Dedalus was, in actuality, an expression of Joyce's own escape from Ireland's denizens of darkness. Both Joyce and McCourt were expatriates. They left the nation that bore them for good, and they returned, as it is written, only for funerals. Joyce largely spent his years in Paris and other realms on the European continent, while McCourt left Ireland for good at the age of 19 to forge a life in America, where he became a public school teacher, a renowned author, and a commentator on the Irish experience. What is most interesting about these two great Irish expatriate authors is that while they escaped from Ireland practically, their literary lenses remained forever focused upon their Irish experiences. For good or for bad, they were children of the old sod who remained bent on examining it, critiquing it, and ever and always calling it to higher ground. Joyce does so literally, while McCourt's effort is more subliminal. A portrait of the artist as a young man in Angela's ashes just happened to be and will forever remain among the greatest works of Irish authors, different ages, different times, different points of focus, but each is a masterpiece in its own right and in its own time. In their common focus upon the powerful impacts of the Catholic Church and Irish patriotic fervor, each sees through the clear hypocrisies and the mysteries each determined to rise above these age-old sociological and theological traps, and McCourt and his siblings above the cruel, cruel poverty that they knew. Each author in all of their brilliant efforts to come forever cast their eyes back upon Ireland. They extracted what was best about the land that bore them, and they paid it forward. Oh, for sure, Joyce and McCourt left Ireland but Ireland forever lived in them. The Irish simply never give up upon Ireland. And they were in spirit and in the deep recesses of their beings forever sons of the old sod, Irish to the bone. Give Ireland back to the Irish. Make Ireland Irish today. It was sung. And they have in unimagined ways listened and tamed the tyrannies and celebrated the love of God and of the bits of land that are theirs, and of the music, and the mysticism, and the legends that define them. They have grown and modernized, and done their bid as a country to save Mother Earth herself. They rather rendered Ireland that something more. These two wrote at different times, in different agents of the same Ireland, 
but they asked the same questions. Joyce passed back in 1941 in Zurich, Switzerland during World War II. And McCourt in Manhattan not that long ago in 2009 at the age of 79. These two who helped tame those tyrannies and shone a bright light upon what it ought to mean to be Irish and to render the faith and the pride in citizenship into forces for good and for life rather than forces for darkness and death. Well done, James Joyce, Frank McCourt. Well done, Ireland. It was, after all, always yours. So up the Irish indeed, and happy St. Patrick's Day, when I'll dream of praying with the good sisters at Our Lady of Knock who once prayed for me, and walk in the fields of Innisfree where the winds blow soft in the face, and of enjoying a pint in the company of the fine crowd at Cohen's Bar. May the road rise up to meet you, and the wind be always at your back. That's a wrap for today. I thank you, as ever, for taking the time to listen. Smile on your brothers and sisters. Have a great week. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Take care, my friends. Mm -hmm.